The cold passed reluctantly from the earth, and the retiring fogs revealed an army stretched out on the hills, resting. As the landscape changed from brown to green, the army awakened and began to tremble with eagerness at the noise of rumors. It cast its eyes upon the roads, which were growing from long troughs of liquid mud to proper thoroughfares. A river, amber-tinted in the shadow of its banks, hurled at the army's feet, and at night, when the stream had become a sorrowful blackness, one could see across it the red, eye-like gleam of hostile campfires set in the low brows of distant hills. The opening lines of Stephen Crane's classic novel, The Red Badge of Courage, are firmly rooted in the dirt and grass of central Virginia. Published in serial form in 1894 and as a novel the following year, the fictional story unfolds during the spring of 1863 and the Chancellorsville campaign. As the opening scene continues, federal soldiers argue about the rumors for the Army of the Potomac's next movement. This has a profound effect on one young soldier, Henry Fleming. He tried to mathematically prove to himself that he would not run from a battle. Previously, he had never felt obliged to wrestle too seriously with this question. In his life, he had taken certain things for granted, never challenging his belief in ultimate success and bothering little about means and roads. But here, he was confronted with a thing of the moment. It had suddenly appeared to him that perhaps in a battle, he might run. He was forced to admit that as far as war was concerned, he knew nothing of himself. As the campaign march begins, Henry spends a lot of time observing his fellow soldiers in the regiment and pondering how he will react when he is in battle for the first time. Soon, the regiment moves towards the sound of the guns. After a time, the brigade was halted in the cathedral light of a forest. The busy skirmishers were still popping. Through the aisles of the wood could be seen the floating smoke from their rifles. During this halt, many men in the regiment began erecting tiny hills in front of them. They used stones, sticks, earth, and anything they thought might turn a bullet. The regiment is moved from the shelter of their temporary trench and enters combat for the first time. Henry sees some of his comrades fall dead or wounded. He develops a fiery anger, realizing war is not the glory he once thought it was and fearing that he has been sent out to be killed. In the second attack, Henry's resolve breaks. Directly, he began to speed toward the rear in great leaps. His rifle and cap were gone. His unbuttoned coat bulged in the wind. The flap of his cartridge box bobbed wildly and his canteen by its slender cord swung out behind. On his face was the horror of those things which he imagined. He ran like a blind man. Since he had turned his back upon the fight, his fears had been wondrously magnified. Death, about to thrust him between the shoulder blades, was far more dreadful than death about to smite him between the eyes. After Henry flees from his regiment's battle line, he has a series of encounters with ghostly corpse, wounded soldiers on the road, and officers who say that his regiment did not flee under fire. After witnessing the death of one of his close friends, Henry begins to regret his flight while still making attempts to justify that he has lived to fight another day. The youth cringed, as if discovered in a crime. By heavens, they had won after all. He turned away, amazed and angry. He felt that he had been wronged. He went from the fields into a thick wood, as if resolved to bury himself. He wished to get out of hearing of the cracking shots, which were to him like voices. At times, he regarded the wounded soldiers in an envious way. 
He wished that he too had a wound, a red badge of courage. Later in the evening, as Henry tries to confront another unit of fleeing soldiers, he is struck on the head and finally gets a wound. With this injury as his cover excuse, he decides to return to his regiment, arriving late in the night and welcome back without suspicions of cowardice. The following morning, Henry gets ready for another day of battle, but approaches the coming experience with a different perspective and a new determination. He did not give a great deal of thought to these battles that lay directly before him. It was not essential that he should plan his ways in regard to them. He could leave much to chance. Besides, a faith in himself had secretly blossomed. There was a little flower of confidence growing within him. He was now a man of experience. Henry's new resolves are quickly put to the test, and he fights with a barbaric fierceness, earning the admiration of his officer and fellow soldiers. By chance, Henry overhears a general ordering his regiment to attack in a desperate, nearly suicidal charge. Faced with the knowledge and choice, Henry, already offended at the general's insulting nickname for his unit, decides they must succeed and prove their courage. He takes a prominent part in rallying and leading the regiment, and in the midst of the charge, Henry is inspired by the regimental flag. Within him, as he hurled himself forward, was born a love, a despairing fondness for this flag which was near him. It was a creation of beauty and invulnerability. It was a goddess, radiant, that bended its form with an imperious gesture to him. It was a woman, red and white, hating and loving, that called him with the voice of his hopes. Because no harm could come to it, he endowed it with power. He kept near, as if it could be a saver of lives, and an imploring cry went from his mind. In the mad scramble, he was aware that the color sergeant flinched suddenly, as if struck by a bludgeon. He faltered, and then became motionless, save for his quivering knee. He made a spring and clutched at the pole. The youth and his friend had a small scuffle over the flag. Give it to me. No, let me keep it. Each felt satisfied with the other's possession of it, but each felt bound to declare by an offer to carry the emblem his willingness to further risk himself. The youth roughly pushed his friend away. He saw that to be firm soldiers they must go forward. It would be death to stay in the present place. The youth kept the bright colors to the front. He was waving his free arm in furious circles, all the while shrieking mad calls and appeals, urging on those that did not need to be urged. For it seemed that the mob of blue men hurling themselves on the dangerous group of rifles were again grown suddenly wild with an enthusiasm of unselfishness. After moving from cowardice to courage, inexperience to veteran, and panic philosophy to passion and inspiration, Henry Fleming discovers that he has proved himself and crossed the threshold from youth to manhood. As the Union Army retreats in the rain, he begins to forgive himself for running, realizes that he has redeemed himself, and leaves the field of battle changed forever. He felt a quiet manhood, non-assertive, but of sturdy and strong blood. He knew that he would no more quail before his guides wherever they should point. He had been to touch the great death, and found that, after all, it was but the great death. He was a man. And so it came to pass that as he trudged from the place of blood and wrath, his soul changed. He came from hot plowshares to prospects of clover tranquilly. And it was as if hot plowshares were not. Scars faded as flowers. It rained. The procession of weary soldiers became a bedraggled train, 
despondent and muttering, marching with churning effect in a trough of liquid brown mud under a low, wretched sky. Yet the youth smiled, for he saw that the world was a world for him, though many discovered it to be made of oaths and walking sticks. He had rid himself of the red sickness of battle. The sultry nightmare was in the past. He had been an animal, blistered and sweating, in the heat and pain of war. He turned now with a lover's thirst to images of tranquil skies, fresh meadows, cool brooks, an existence of soft and eternal peace. Over the river, a golden ray of sun came through the hosts of leaden rain clouds.